Okay, you are muted, Paul. There, I got unmuted. I haven't gotten the successful screen share yet, however. And for some reason, I'm not seeing the screen I want to share. Try again. I've been covered over with so many other things, I guess. Well, my apologies. There we are. Now then, I can get that to share. Excuse my slow term manipulation, but I think I'm going to be able to share a screen here now with There we go. Finally, I've got, I've got Bruce Van Orden on the screen. <clears throat> and uh, we'll begin there. Now, hopefully you can see him. Yes, we do. All right. Let me go back to that uh, picture then. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. I'm sorry about the clumsy beginning there, but I found myself uh, with so many files open on my computer that I couldn't find the uh, screen that has Bruce's uh, picture on it to, to introduce. And he received his bachelor's, his bachelor's, and his doctorate from Brigham Young University. He is an emeritus professor of church history and doctrine at that same school. He gave us the earlier presentation on the life and times of W.W. W. Phelps, We'll Sing and We'll Shout. And that is such a marvelous book. I am so impressed with it and the tremendous research that's gone into it. It's a major contribution to our appreciation of church history. And it also has some very strong ties to the Book of Mormon. But anyway, uh, he has, uh, he showed that Phelps served as the voice of Joseph Smith on many occasions, and uh, particularly in Independence, Missouri. And oftentimes he was the means whereby antagonism, antagonism with non-Mormons was stirred, stimulated, because he was advocating Zionic conditions and human rights in a slave state. This evening, he returns to share the story of George Reynolds, who was an advocate for the freedom of religion, strongly supported by his Book of Mormon beliefs. And so I ask for you to welcome Dr. Van Orden with your good questions, good attention, and, uh, and the another good session on the forum. Let us begin with a prayer together. Originator, idea generator, former of galaxies, creator of our solar system, of Earth, of continuity of cycles of life, of agency for the image creation called man. We bow in recognition that we are so small, so insignificant in the multiverse with its multidimensional span. And yet you invite us to use our agency to choose to embrace your eternal plan, while at the same time offering grace, forgiveness for souls we present unclean before your scan. We come to you this evening to consider words presented by your servant, Bruce Van Orden, about George Reynolds, an example of one whose life was com compromised for advocacy of religious rights, who submitted to the jail warden, one whose lifestyle was one with which we might not agree, particularly in the fact they chose to practice polygamy, 
Yet the separation of church and state deserves our consideration and advocacy. And so we look with interest for lessons to be learned from history, especially those which help us decode your great mystery. And we ask for your blessing on our presenter, his listeners, those who inquire later, every woman and man, that we seek the truth, embrace its tendrils entangled in facts, in preparation for our own judgment, in which we face the eternal scan. And this we pray in the name of the juror of justice, the Prince of Peace, the Christ with you from the beginning and on through eternity. Amen. All right, Bruce, thank you for coming and being here early to uh, check in, check out uh, the system. And we're, uh, wow, we've got more people that have joined us here. I'm delighted to see the the uh, page filling up. And uh, I'm looking forward to what you, can, what you have to share with us. Christopher Thomas, Carol, Kathy, Spencer, Alice, all the regular people. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, over the uh, several months, uh, I've occasionally tuned in and enjoyed the association and the speakers. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Paul, the brotherhood, and I really feel that. I enjoy the uh, friendship and kindness that uh, you definitely exude. Uh, I've noticed that uh, from time to time you have representatives from the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints out of Salt Lake City, like I am, uh, and I hope to uh, share some of uh, our perspectives, as particularly regarding the Book of Mormon this evening. So let me uh, get to the uh, sharing. Okay, there we have it. Uh, you can see... Um, the book here, uh, I published this book in 1992, Prisoner for Conscience Sake, The Life and Life of uh, George Reynolds. Uh, originally, it was uh, my uh, dissertation. A and uh, in 1987, I received the uh, Dissertation of the Year Award from uh, Mormon History Association for my uh, work on George Reynolds. He was an early Book of Mormon expert in Utah. Now, as time has gone on, even since I wrote this book <clears throat> and did all this research, there has been considerable commentary that has come out in printed form about the Book of Mormon uh, in our tradition. There was a whole lot less uh, in the 1980s, 1970s, and certainly in the days when uh, George Reynolds lived. You can see that he only lived 67 years, and uh, he was very prolific, but he worked himself to death, basically. Before I get into him, though, I definitely wanted to uh, mention something from uh, a little over a week ago. At the recent uh, Mormon History Association conference in Cleveland, near Kirtland, uh, in the opening session, Elder Kyle McKay of the uh, 70, uh, General Authority 70 of our church, and who has uh, been given the assignment of being the official church history church historian and recorder, he came to speak in the opening session, particularly about the acquisition of the Kirtland Temple and the other uh, sites and artifacts. Uh, he was very gracious towards everybody and highly thankful uh, for the uh, great work uh, of uh, the community of Christ in caring for the, uh, the uh, Kirtland Temple and his uh, sadness that uh, many people from our tradition have uh, been involved in uh, too much of the negotiating phase of trying to say, when are we going to finally get the Kirtland Temple from you? He, he was very apologetic for all that type of thing. I really enjoyed his presentation. He asked for questions, and I stood up at first and get asked the first question. Turns out that somebody from uh, Desert News took my, this picture of me asking that question. My, uh, I had earlier that day I went gone to the Kirtland Temple and went off to the north side uh, and saw that the plaques were missing uh, for the uh, schoolhouse and the printing office. And so I asked uh, in a kind manner, uh, they're gone. Are we going to just forget them? And uh, he was gracious in his answer. He said, actually, I hope to see that they are rebuilt. That was 
his desire. We'll see if ever that comes to pass. But uh, he does plan to have some kind of recognition of the schoolhouse and the uh, printing office in Kirtland. Okay, now on to uh, George Reynolds. Um, Bruce, yeah. if, I may, if I may intrude there. Please. I have proposed a uh, bicentennial project to do the archaeology at that printing office at Kirtland to add another chapter to our printing history, having worked on the times and seasons at Nauvoo and uh, having uh, recognizing the need for us to do the same at Far West and Independence, but uh, to be able to get the, the printing office that burned at Kirtland could be extremely important for us to be able to add that significant chapter. And I'm delighted to hear you suggest the historian is interested in that, whether he, whether he expands it to, uh, well, we have, we had um, Josh Gailey of the Monongahela group and uh, Ryan Salzgiver of the LDS and myself uh, working as a uh, coordinating team on that. But of course, with the change of stewardship, uh, that has fallen apart. But nonetheless, you're mentioning, you're, you're mentioning the historian's interest is exciting for me. Thank you very much for that note. I surely hope that uh, there will be 100% cooperation. I was going to mention too that uh, on the way back from Kirtland, uh, my wife and I actually drove the entire distance. We stopped in Nauvoo uh, to see how things were going there. Uh, I was sad to see that the visitor center is completely shut up at the moment and not being used. Uh, uh, some things are going well there, others I don't think are quite so good. And, and I was uh, displeased that, uh, that no longer your work uh, has been able to move forward at the times and seasons place. I went there and, and it's starting to grow over. Uh, plants are growing over your site there at the uh, original printing house. Okay, moving on to uh, uh, George Reynolds. Uh, the uh, official monthly church magazine for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints up until about five years ago was entitled Enzyme. In the 1986 August edition, uh, in the year that the Book of Mormon was emphasized in our church, and it is emphasized uh, every four years, uh, I was allowed and invited to uh, write this piece about uh, George Reynolds, loyal friend of the Book of Mormon. Uh, this is uh, an online uh, digitization of it. Though unknown to most members of the church today, George Reynolds was widely known by his fellow saints a century ago for his service to the church in a variety of impressive ways. And I'll be going over briefly some of those other ones. But it is for the work, his work with the Book of Mormon that George Reynolds was most recognized, and I'll focus on that this evening. George was born uh, 1 January 1842 near London, England. He first became acquainted with the church at age seven, overhearing men in his father's tailor shop making derogatory remarks about the Mormon. Well, that's how we got started, and I'll tell you more. Uh, I want to inject uh, this passage from Our Doctrine and Covenant, section 130. It's actually a quotation from Joseph Smith's uh, address to the people in Ramus, uh, a few uh, miles east of Nauvoo, when he went to visit the saints there in 1842, and it became canonized uh, in the Brigham Young period <clears throat> in our Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, this is, uh, these two verses became basically mottos for George Reynolds. Whatever principle of intelligence we attain unto in this life, it will rise with us in the resurrection. And if a person gains more knowledge and intelligence in this life through his diligence and obedience than another, he will have so much of the advantage in the world to come. Well, here's a man who dedicated his life to study, learning, growing, and sharing, and teaching. George Reynolds was born at his parents' home on Regent Street in the district of Marylebone, London, England, on New Year's Day, 1842. London was still in the throes of the Industrial Revolution, which had begun at the turn of the century. Young Queen Victoria had reigned for nearly five years. The year 1842 was the fourth consecutive year of meager harvests and heavy unemployment. Hence, food prices were high and wages low. Because his was a middle-class family, 
young George Reynolds was not as adversely affected by these deprivations as most of his countrymen. Indeed, his family circumstances were improved by the modernization sweeping England. His father, also named George Reynolds, was a master tailor on Regent Street, uh, and near the center of London. He ran a lucrative shop because of the brisk business from an increasingly wealthy capitalist class. Young George's opportunities for education, and he had several, both in his homeland and uh, when he was uh, 13 years old for a year in France, were benefits of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is an article that came out in uh, our church's uh, weekly publication, uh, part of the Deseret News, which is the uh, newspaper owned by our church, uh, but is for public consumption. And on Saturdays, there was the church section or church news. And uh, uh, in the final page of the church news, there was always some kind of uh, vignette about somebody who was important. And this is one about George Reynolds. Uh, it tells the story of his uh, going to his grandmother's house in London. And the maid there was named Mary White, and she was a convert to uh, the Latter-day Saints. And over time, they had lots of conversations about the nature of God and and uh, and how God worked with people. And she shared that she had uh, joined this new religion, the Mormons, and he became very interested. He had actually heard about them at his father's tailor shop, as I'd already mentioned. Uh, in this article, uh, I'm actually reading from it now. He learned things there that had a familiar ring. That's from, uh, oh, he had a chance to go to church with Mary. Uh, previously in his father's tailor shop, he had heard the uh, workmen uh, talking about a young fellow in America who had found some gold plates in the ground. The uh, writings uh, on the plates he had translated with the Yerman thumb, they had said. So uh, this had a familiar ring, and he got quite excited about it. <clears throat> and at about age 10, uh, having gone to church quite regularly every Sunday now with uh, Mary uh, in his grandmother's neighborhood, he asked for baptism. Well, the elder said, you can't be baptized without your parents' permission. His father said no, and uh, continued to say no, and, uh, and eventually sent him off to France to try to get Mormonism out of him. But he came back, and he still was in, uh, wanted to get involved. Uh, at age uh, 15, he went to a different branch in London, and he, uh, and he asked for baptism that first day. And the elders, not knowing any better, said, fine, it sounds like you're ready, and they baptized him. So uh, before too long, he became a deacon and a junior type of missionary uh, speaking on the streets in London. There are several things about him that are very important. He fulfilled two full-time missions in England, one before he actually immigrated to America, and the second one a few years later. George Q. Cannon was his mentor and mission president, the first mission president. Maybe or maybe not, you've heard of George Q. Cannon. He is exceptionally important in our situation. He himself came from England, uh, and, he, and he went with his family to uh, Nauvoo in the early migration of English converts to Nauvoo, uh, even before uh, Joseph Smith's life was over. <clears throat> he was a teenager at the time. Uh, when they when he got out to Utah, he was a young missionary and went out to Hawaii uh, and learned the Hawaiian language and made it possible, almost single-handedly, at least a bit in the beginning, to make Hawaii an outstanding mission field. Uh, it wasn't long before he was given heavy responsibilities in publishing and editing and leading. And... Uh, by uh, 1860, at age 33, he was called to be an apostle, which was quite young. Uh, and then he was called to be mission president in England a year later. Uh, and it was at that time that uh, George Reynolds, as a 19-year-old, became a missionary, uh, a single man, as ma and many other young single English fellows, uh, although there were many Americans also in the mission field over there. Uh, when George Kukanik went back to Salt Lake, he became a counselor to Brigham Young. When Brigham Young passed away, George Kukanik became first counselor to John Taylor, then first counselor to Wilfred Woodruff, then first counselor to Lorenzo Snow, 
and months before Lorenzo Snow ended up dying, George Buchanan passed away, but he was actually the senior uh, apostle at this point, and had he outlived Lorenzo Snow, would have been the next president of the church, even though he never served in that capacity. He, uh, for many years, was the representative of Utah Territory uh, in the United States Congress. Uh, and uh, he, he's been dubbed the Richelieu of Mormonism because he, he was the power behind the throne. He was the one who uh, helped the uh, presidents of the church make decisions. He was quite a leader in his own right. Uh, and as the years went by, he was the most important Mormon there was. Uh, if you were to make a list of the top six or seven influential Mormons in Latter-day Saint history, George Buchanan would be about sixth or seventh in that whole list. Uh, and, and Cannon was George Reynolds' mentor throughout the rest of his life. Uh, George Reynolds was involved in plural marriage. He was the polygamy test case. I'm going to tell more about that. And he was the first prisoner for conscience sake. <clears throat> the editors of my book wanted to have as a subtitle, Prisoner for Conscience Sake, because it kind of had a good ring to it. Uh, it turns out that over a thousand Mormon men were incarcerated for polygamy during the anti-polygamy crusade and maybe 2,000 avoided arrest by hiding. George Reynolds was also a secretary to presidents of the church. Not long after he came to Zion, as they called it, uh, and, and he emigrated in 1865, he was, giving, he was given some <clears throat> lower level assignments in the office of the presidency but then he rose and got higher level secretary jobs under Brigham Young. Uh, and uh, because he entered polygamy in 1874, George Q. Cannon asked him at that time of distress for the church because many people, Brigham Young and Cannon included, were subject pretty much to arrest under the Poland Act that had passed. But the church officials made an arrangement with the uh, federal officials. Let's have a test case. And so the test case was picked. And that was George Reynolds, who had recently ended polygamy. I'll talk more about that. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> George Reynolds served as secretary to five presidents. He was private secretary, actually, to uh, John Taylor and for a while to Wilfred Woodruff. And under, uh, and under uh, Lorenzo Snow and Joseph F. Smith, he also served as secretary. Uh, one of the apostles once said that uh, when George Reynolds would arrive at the pearly gates, they would say, here comes George Reynolds, let's make him secretary, because he was secretary of so many things, he was very effective as a secretary, for sure. Uh, secretary and treasurer, over lots of businesses, over many church entities. <clears throat> he came from Britain, where the Sunday school organizations had set, been set up in many of the Protestant denominations. And of course, uh, Cannon knew about it too. So Cannon and Reynolds were both effective in setting up Sunday schools, in Utah and became leaders in that organization. Uh, when uh, Reynolds became uh, about 58 years old, he was called to be a general authority in the church. In those days, the general authorities were the first presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve, the presiding bishopric, and the seven presidents of 70, and he became one of the seven presidents. These days, the general authorities in our church have been expanded to about 70 70s. Uh, as serving as general authorities. George Reynolds became a prolific author, and I'll mention more about that, and we'll be uh, focusing uh, for, on him as a Book of Mormon expert. George Reynolds' name is remembered, if for no other reason, than that he was the defendant in such a landmark Supreme Court decision. It was Reynolds v. United States, decided in 1879, although it was a case uh, that started in the local courts and then finally made it to the Supreme Court, but it was a case that lasted five years uh, in various courts. <clears throat> George would have preferred otherwise. He never saw it nor enjoyed the limelight, but he was also willing to suffer any indignity or sacrifice to help move forward the cause of Zion, as he considered it. Now he is required to go to prison as a sacrificial lamb for Mormonism. 
Let's talk about uh, his wives. Uh, I'm sure that you're somewhat interested in this. I also realize that uh, a plural marriage is probably something you don't like, uh, but it certainly was a major factor in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. While he was a young missionary, single, starting at age 19 and up through 23, four years worth, Church authorities considered it an advantage for young English missionaries to be either married or engaged at the time they were emigrated to Zion. For, the, for these reasons, uh, during George's months in Liverpool as President Cannon's private and immigration secretary, he continued his quest to find a wife. Earlier in the London Conference in 1861, George had become acquainted with a Latter-day Saint family, the Tubnams. He started taking romantic interest in their teenage daughter, Polly. Over time, President Cannon encouraged the relationship and gave his blessing to it. <clears throat> the Tuddenhams emigrated before George, Polly included. But once in Salt Lake City, George continued to court Polly, and they were married 21 July 1865, just a few weeks after he arrived, in the endowment house. <clears throat> Maybe you've heard of the endowment house. That was uh, completed in 1855 as a temporary temple, uh, primarily for the benefit of uh, congregants to receive the endowment and then to be married uh, in the new and everlasting covenant of marriage and sealed as we use that terminology. Uh, it wasn't used for a lot of other ordinances like baptism for the dead or uh, sealings for the dead or work for the dead, but it was for the living and it was a temporary temple. George and Polly eventually had 11 children. Okay. In 1871, a few years after they were married, George, as many other young married men in our church at the time, were called on foreign missions. Well, he was called to go back to his home life, the British mission, 1871. Here's a picture of some of the missionaries in that British mission in that year, and he is the, the one in the uh, upper right-hand corner. Uh, most of his work was actually with editing the Millennial Star, or being the assistant editor anyway, under the uh, president of the British Mission. So he used his uh, uh, considerable talents at that time. Okay, back home. Okay, I, I went too far, Seuss, excuse me, I'll get back. Uh, Back home, uh, again in late 1872, George once more assumed several heavy duties at church headquarters. As a recognized leader now, he came to realize that he should enter the principle of plural marriage. Often they recall, they called it just the principle. With Polly's permission, George wrote to Amelia Jane Schofield, daughter of the church's branch president in Manchester, England, asking her to become his second wife. Amelia immediately accepted the proposal. She immigrated early in 1874. They were sealed in the endowment house on 3 August that year. By the way, um, she ended up being the mother of uh, Ethel Georgiana Reynolds, who married Joseph Fielding Smith, uh, a grandnephew of Joseph Smith Jr. and a grandson of Hiram Smith. Uh, so uh, it kind of ties in with that Mormon royalty here. <clears throat> Amelia immediately accepted his oh, we said that. Okay. George took this step uh, in his journal, most thoroughly convinced that plural marriage was the law of the Lord to fulfill that law and escape the condemnation in his displeasure. Uh, these people who were leaders figured this was a commandment that they should engage in. In fact, they would be condemned if they did. That's how they felt. He added, this I did conscientiously and to carry out my most deep-seated religious convictions. It was right after that that uh, he was designated to be the polygamy test case. I've told you that it took... Uh, four and a half years to go through the whole process. and But when it was decided by the Supreme Court, it was nine to zero. The Supreme Court said, we don't care if it is your religious practice. This is an odious practice. 
it goes against the consciousness of all Americans. It is un-American. It doesn't belong in this nation. It, it cannot be justified under the First Amendment, nine to zero, no way, no how. And, uh, and thus the anti-polygamy crusade was uh, often running and before long, all kinds of Mormon polygamous men had to either hide or, of course, were arrested and and had to give time themselves. Okay, he got out, though, in 1881 and became the uh, private secretary to the new church president, John Taylor. And in this case, he, uh, in response to what he referred to as direct revelation, George secretly married a third wife, Mary Gulliford Gould, in the endowment house in 1885. Mary, an English immigrant, was 26 at the time of this union. Uh, and remember, he was born in 1842, so uh, he's now in his 40s. She had been hired by President John Taylor as a maid in his official residence, where George and she became acquainted. President Taylor encouraged this marriage. Mary was instrumental in caring for the ailing Polly, George's first wife, who died in December of 1885. And then she cared for uh, her minor children, and she was really a very kind and generous woman. Everybody will give that testimony. Mary had nine children of her own, last one born in 1903. So this made a total of 32 children fathered by George Reynolds. I figured you'd like to get that information. Four of those children died uh, early, though, two in infancy and two as toddlers. So 28 eventually, I guess, made it to adulthood. In 1907, when George Reynolds was celebrating his 65th birthday, his, all of his posterity were there. So he had a photo taken of my 12 sons. And he uh, actually compared this with Jacob and his 12 sons, in, at least in the number and maybe significance. You can see that <clears throat> many of these are adult men by now who had uh, been missionaries themselves and were into their careers, but some of these were little boys, 12 sons. You can see that George there in the middle looks quite old and decrepit. He was only 65. Later that very day, he suffered a severe stroke, that very day, and he didn't get better. He died two years later at age 67. Uh, so this is an interesting story how it all came together. He died of overwork, no question about it. He gave so much work to what he uh, was engaged. He was in, involved in so many different things. Let's talk about uh, him being an author. <clears throat> he authored uh, all sorts of articles, about 400 and some, in various periodicals. <clears throat> Let's mention the Millennial Star. That's the one that's in the British mission for over 80 years. Uh, he actually uh, started uh, writing in behalf of uh, George Q. Cannon while he was a young missionary. Uh, he wrote eventually 108 articles in, in the Millennial Star, but some right away. Uh, titles included uh, I'll Ask Counsel, sitting in 1865, Hints to Immigrants, when he was on his second mission, Presidents and Presiding, Are We of Israel? He had uh, a multi- serial set of articles about Israel. He actually believed, at least in part, in the uh, doctrine of Anglo-Israelism, that uh, many of the House of Israel, the 10 lost tribes, had made their way to <clears throat> the British Isles, and that much of Israel is found in Britain. And uh, he believed in large measure in that, and he gave that as a reason why there are so many converts out of Britain. He also wrote a lot about the Book of Abraham. It's genuous, genuineness established. Uh, the Book of Abraham is quite significant in the Latter-day Saint tradition. The Alma family, Book of Mormon, objections to the Book of Mormon. Uh, these are over the years. The next up here article that I'd like to mention is the Juvenile Instructor. That was established by George Q. Cannon when he got back from the British Mission in 1865 as he started get the Sunday school program. And this was a monthly uh, magazine, mostly for Sunday school children at the time. Well, <clears throat> George came to Zion in 1865 and 66, and he started writing 
or his mentor, all sorts of articles like the Good Samaritan, Roman Conquest of Jerusalem, a lot of historical stuff, the Pool of Hezekiah, Don't Be Cruel, John Wesley, I Am the Bread of Life, Time Occupied in Translating the Book of Mormon. That was quite a good article. It deal, dealt with the idea that the Book of Mormon was translated with all of the Calgary the way we now have it in about 60 days. And Revelation-Inspiration. Those are some examples from the juvenile instructor. Let's see. Okay, let's get to the next one. Uh, another magazine that got started in the 1870s is The Contributor. It was a magazine for the new organizations that came out in the 1870s. YMMIA is Young Men's Mutual Improvement Association. That's for young men in those days, 14 through 21. Later, it came to be 12 to uh, 19. And then there was the YLMIA, Young Ladies MIA, Mutual Improvement Association. <clears throat> 36 total articles beginning with the Nephites under the judges, the Edmonds Bill, which was an anti-polygamy legislation, Mormon and Jew, a modern parallel, history of the Book of Mormon, translation of the records, evidences of the Book of Mormon, external proofs. And then much later in life, he published a few articles in newer periodicals, Liahona, the Elder's Journal, which was mostly for mission uh, uh, missions around the globe, and uh, the Young Women's Journal that got going, and the Improvement Era, which got going. So he wrote articles for them too. Okay, uh, Book of Mormon, let's emphasize that now. <clears throat> He was in prison, and he was in prison from uh, 1879 through 1881, and the first prison. First, he went to the Nebraska State Penitentiary, which was used uh, by the federal government for federal prisoners for a while. But uh, Cannon, who was working in Washington, D.C. as a congressional delegate, worked with President Rutherford B. Hayes not to give him pardon, which he asked for, that wasn't granted, but at least to get him changed to the Utah Territorial Penitentiary. So he spent most of his uh, prison in Utah Territorial Penitentiary, at least close to home. It was in prison that George began to make his great contribution to Book of Mormon commentary. He spent the early months in the penitentiary reading the standard works. Standard works is a phrase we use in our tradition all the time. We always say it, but you may not be familiar with that phrase. It means the four standard works, which we call the Holy Scriptures. The, the, the Bible is one, although I like to look at the Bible as the Old Testament and the New Testament, but the Holy Bible's standard work number one, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. We have that. The Pearl of Great Price contains uh, some of the uh, Joseph Smith translation, which we call the Book of Moses. We have the Book of Abraham. We have uh, much of Joseph Smith's history in there. We have uh, the Articles of Faith. Reynolds was thrilled with the new 1879 edition of the Book of Mormon. Uh, I hope this is uh, new and interesting to you. In 1879, our church came out with a new edition, arranged into chapters and verses by Elder Orson Pratt. Orson Pratt only lived a few more months after he accomplished this task. He was one of the original apostles. He was in his early 20s when he was called in 1835 to be an apostle, and he died uh, in 1880 uh, uh, or 81, I think. In any event, he arranged the Book of Mormon into our current chapters and verses. And people say the Book of Mormon according to chapters and verses in our church, and that all began, however, under Pratt. And he felt motivated to write about the book, uh, George did. That got him going. And write he did, about 80 published articles in all, most of them about the Book of Mormon, all while in prison. Here are some of the articles he wrote while in prison about the Book of Mormon, going left to right. The Zoramites, the Law of the Nephites, Agriculture among the Nephites, Domestic Life among the Nephites, The Art of War among the Nephites, Science and Literature among the Nephites, Personal Appearance of the, ne of the Nephites, what they look like, Language of the Nephites, Nephite proper names, a Nephite enigma, the monies of the Nephites, a Book of Mormon enigma, the lands of the Nephites, 
Internal Evidences of the Book of Mormon, Lessons from the Life of Nephi, the Jaredites. These are some of the articles he wrote while in prison. The actual work of writing in prison was not easy. He did have long stretches of uninterrupted time for thought and meditation, but his journal reveals that the terrible monotony of prison life was the single greatest threat to him. Furthermore, the prison yard where he worked <clears throat> was far from conducive to writing. By the way, when I was just a child, the Utah State Penitentiary was still in Sugar House, a portion of Salt Lake City, and it still had those same original buildings uh, of brick uh, that he went to when in the 18, 1879 to 1881. Seated on a small stool with his notes nailed on the wall in front of him, he wrote in longhand on the small lap board. Dust often blinded him, and the wind would flurry his papers over the yard during the miserably hot, dry summer. The winter is one of the coldest on record in Utah, with the temperature frequently dipping below zero. By the way, climate change has made it so that we barely ever go through below zero now, although when I was younger, it was frequent. And we're getting the heat here, too. You mentioned heat, some of you. We got to about 100 today ourselves, although our humidity is not as high. <clears throat> the temperature frequently uh, dipped below zero when George was there, numbing George's fingers, but he pressed relentlessly on. During the summer of 1880, in a depressed and frustrated mood, George stopped writing for a month. Then a brainstorm hit him. The, the church could use a concordance to the Book of Mormon, similar to Alexander Cruden's complex concordance to the Old and New Testaments. With new vigor, George plunged back into his work, transcribing passages from the Book of Mormon at the rate of as many as 350 per day. In October, he was granted permission to work by day in the relative comfort of the guard's dining room, which enabled him to work even more rapidly. By the time of his release in uh, January of 1881, George had completed 25,000 entries in his concordance. Uh, myth came out uh, that he did all of this in, the, in jail. He couldn't have done it because it was too uh, big of a project, and he only got maybe a tenth of a ton. Uh, so, uh, but it was started here. His monumental work continued on in his spare time. Remember, I told you he worked himself to death, and he completed this in 1904 uh, and published it just a year before his stroke. This is what it looks like on the outside, and I don't know if you can see my picture still, but uh, here's my copy of the. Uh, Concordance of the Book of Mormon, and it is very dense and in small print. It is absolutely an amazing work. Uh, here are a couple of the pages, and you really can't tell them that easily. Every single word in the Book of Mormon is in this concordance. Even every time the word a or the word an or the word and or the word the is mentioned, is in this concordance and of course all the other words here on this particular page you can see gideon gilead give girdling girdling is only one time uh girded a few times it is absolutely stunning what he did now in the days of computer we can get this job done in another effective way but it is amazing what he accomplished here's a, another page of it he worked so relentlessly on this. It, it was his, the love of his life. He loved the Book of Mormon so very much, no question about it. Okay, the story of the Book of Mormon is a book. After Brother Reynolds was released from prison, <clears throat> many of his friends urged him to organize his private writings on the Book of Mormon into a single volume. In 1888, his story of the Book of Mormon appeared. The first complete, though unofficial, commentary on the text of the Book of Mormon in our church. We, we didn't have such a commentary ever before, and it's complete. This volume provided a generation of the church's youth, it was used in Sunday schools, with the first training in the history and doctrines of the Book of Mormon. It was illustrated with 42 beautifully drawn pictures of incidents from Book of Mormon history, the first, the first such published. The illustrators included uh, famous men in Utah, George M. Ottinger, William T. Armitage, John Held, C.W. Morris. The opening passage of the book of the story of the Book of Mormon reveals the flavor 
of Brendan Reynolds's writing. Note the editorial use of we, a common literary device of the time. This is now from his first page. The story that we are about to relate is a true one. It is the history of the race, races, who lived on this broad land of ours long ago. And by the way, uh, Re Reynolds believed, and, uh, and I believe at this point in time, very much in error, that the Book of Mormon talked about, geographically speaking, almost all of South America, all of Central America, and almost all of North America. I don't, I don't, most people don't come up with that idea today, but he believed it and taught it in his day. From it, we shall learn many lessons of God's great love for man. We shall also learn how often his love has been spurned, how apt his favored children have been to walk in ways of sin, and how prone to disobey his holy law. It is a story full of light and shade, one which it will be well for uh, all of us to take to heart. For by so doing, our faith in God will increase, and we shall be prompted to strive the more earnestly to avoid the evils that others, by their misdeeds, have brought upon themselves and their posterity. You can see that he his heart was really filled with the whole complete message of the Book of Mormon. This is what it looked like. It wasn't so handsome as some publishes, publishings today, but it was easy to pick up and use in Sunday schools. Here, it is, here are two examples of the illustrations that were commissioned to be written. One of Jesus appearing to the Nephite nation uh, after his resurrection in the old world. And, uh, and then you see this flavor of Central America with the Central America temples here uh, of uh, what he considered to be holy places in the Book of Mormon. Then he went to work on another book, a dictionary of the Book of Mormon. Uh, and, and this is the first page of it, you can see here on the left, by Elder George Reynolds. By this time, he was one of the uh, general authorities of the church. This is a fascinating compilation, too. Every single name, city, land, river, hill, anything that is a, a name is uh, identified in this dictionary with as complete of a uh, description of what is meant and what happened with that name as you would want. It's an amazing compilation. It was used also in the early days to help people with their study of the Book of Mormon, a dictionary. I've already mentioned that in more recent times, all kinds of commentaries have been coming out on the Book of Mormon. In our church, we have uh, studies that are based on one-year cycles, for a four-year cycle, but one year at a time. The Old Testament is studied thoroughly in all church circles, Sunday school, the primary organization for the youth, the seminaries and institutes for the uh, uh, high school and college-age people, uh, the adult Sunday schools, and in the homes. We now have a program called Come, Follow Me, uh, using a phrase from Jesus, uh, where people uh, have curriculum where they can study in their homes about this particular uh, book of scripture week by week, week by week, month by month, year by year. Uh, one year it's the Old Testament, the next year it's the uh, New Testament, then the Doctrine and Covenants, then the Book of Mormon. It turns out, by the way, in the year 2024, it's the Book of Mormon. In my particular case, I'm reading it in a different language. The language that I learned as a missionary was German. I served my mission in the South German mission as a young man, ages 19 through 21. I love the language very dearly. I've kept up with it. As an undergraduate, I majored in German uh, to be able to teach it. I never did enter that field. I entered into the uh, Latter-day Saint church educational system instead, but I have maintained my German language. So what I'm doing this year in my study is reading chapter by chapter in my second language. And of course, I'm enjoying it very much. When I was growing up, the uh, multi-volume commentary on the Book of Mormon, that's what it was called, was this. It allegedly was co-authored by George Reynolds and Jean-Echaudon. 
Well, in my investigation, I found out that this wasn't co-authored at all. If these two men even knew each other in lifetime, it would have been very rare. Most Latter-day Saints who have heard of George Reynolds associate his name with jean M. Chaudal, a uh, Norwegian convert, and the seven-volume commentary on the Book of Mormon that bears both names. Actually, Elder Reynolds and Brother Chaudal had little, if any, contact while they were alive. But a son of George Reynolds, after George died, married a daughter of Brother Chaudal ten years after his father's death. At 10 years after George's death. This son, with some help from a grandson uh, later of Brother Chaudal, compiled and edited this seven-volume work from the often disparate writings of jean A. Chaudal and George Reynolds. However, the uh, compilers did not make it clear who of the two people were writing. And uh, I, as a researcher, could tell the difference. Once I started seeing this, I was offended by the fact that this was even done the way it was done. But in those early days of my life, this was the largest commentary in the Book of Mormon. It, however, has been replaced by all sorts of commentaries, even after I wrote my book. The book is sold out, but it is available through Desert Book uh, in e-book format. And I just wanted to show you that it, it is available if anyone ever wanted to have it. Okay, that is the uh, end of my a formal presentation, and I wait any of your comments or questions. Okay, thank you, Bruce. And I see other people anxious. I'm going to get myself appropriately listed here. Hmm. Excuse me, but I'm not clear that my my mute is off. Your mute is off. All right. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Bruce. It's a delightful presentation, interesting history, and I find it fascinating that he would be uh, willing to, well, that he'd be willing to to be used as a sacrificial lamb in terms of that uh, uh, trial to be to be the uh, scapegoat, as as it were. And they they, they actually hope that they would win the case naively. Naively, they hope that the, the case would be won and that it wouldn't have to happen. But well, it, it, yeah, it did happen. That, that was a fundamentally on the principle of freedom of religion, was it not? Yeah, that, that was the argument. Didn't go anywhere, but that was the argument. Yeah, so the idea of, of uh, have, having the religious right to polygamy versus the social con constraints against it and uh, so the, as usually happens in government, the government uh, wins. Anyway, uh, help me if you if you could reconcile the the polygamy activity for Brother Reynolds with the Book of Mormon, uh, with its rather clear uh, uh, de declaration that it was a, a an, an abominable doctrine. Jacob chapter two. Yes. <laughs> Uh, in our in our tradition, at least, uh, it, I don't know what chapter it is for you. I'm sorry. Uh, Reynolds and others came up with uh, a justification. Uh, Jacob chapter 2, verse 30, in our Book of Mormon, as it was set up by Orson Pratt. Uh, and after several verses of condemning the practice of plural marriage, as was being done by some of Jacob's contemporaries in the uh, land of Nephi, uh, I, I guess they had actually fled from the land of Nephi by this time, but uh, the Nephite nation. Uh, some of, uh, and Nephi himself was dead and Jacob had taken over. Uh, some of those uh, bo uh, men, uh, I guess, had an eye for other girls and justified uh, taking plural wives because they had seen it in the Bible, particularly with David and Solomon, who were famous. And, and Jacob uh, condemned uh, what they were doing uh, and uh, condemned what uh, David and Solomon had done because they had done so completely against the uh, teachings of God. Uh, in verse 30, though, after that discussion, it says, but if the Lord will, uh, but if I, the Lord, will to uh, raise up seed, then it might be justified, that type of thing. Well, it's a one verse, but it, it's been used all the time, and George Reynolds helped promote it. 
uh, this idea if uh, we're going to raise up seed, that is at least a justification. Now, it goes back, of course, to the uh, what we have as Section 132 in the Doctrine and Covenants, that document that Joseph Smith prepared to give to Emma Smith to uh, somehow convince her that uh, what he was doing, uh, allegedly, I know that a lot of you don't necessarily subscribe to this, but uh, a document was prepared that became Doctrine and Covenants 132 that justifies plural marriage. And in the opening verses of that document, uh, Joseph asks, why is it justified that uh, certain people in the Old Testament had more than one wife? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, David, and Solomon. And it goes on to explain that uh, it was done in righteousness in the case of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because they were commanded to do so. Uh, but in the case of uh, 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 David and Solomon, uh, not so, particularly in the latter stages of what David was doing. Uh, and so uh, it was kind of a mixed bag as far as that document is concerned. Uh, and uh, one of the big things that has come out of the worship programs that we say started with Joseph Smith and then really got going with uh, Brigham Young and the apostleship is the idea of a uh, husband and wife multiplying and replenishing the earth. When a man and wife are... Uh, married and sealed, as we use both terms, uh, in the temples, uh, they are given a charge coming from God even. Uh, and uh, many commandments are given to them. And first among them is go forward and multiply and replenish the earth. In other words, have children uh, and and keep it going. And, uh, and then if you do that, you will have joy and rejoicing in your posterity. Uh, well, that all kind of ties in with uh, what justification they come up with out of Jacob chapter 2, verse 30. I can understand the other argument, but that's the one that has been used. Thank you. Thanks. I see, yeah, I, I'm i anxious to, to hear the questions from the rest of you, and Chris has his hand up. Go ahead, Chris. Nice to see you. Oops, you're muted. Nice to see all of you. And uh, Deb, I know I owe you an email. Uh, I haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> We're good. Uh, Bruce, thanks uh, for your presentation. Uh, I've got about five questions. I'll just ask one or two of them now. Um, in my, what I assume is a first edition, uh, the date of publication is 1900. Of the, uh, of the, the concordance. Orders. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, there was a first edition in 1900, and then I guess the second edition is 1904. I guess I should change that. Yeah. They and and on the inside cover, it says it was entered into the Act of Congress in 1899. Well, uh, okay. Uh, I don't. I, I think that second edition was more complete. But anyway, yeah. Uh, uh, you, you bring up a good point. Uh, so it was a bit earlier that he had f first put it to publication. Yeah, and I, I developed a lot of uh, affection for old George uh, as I've made use of this uh, concordance when I've been doing uh, book, book, of Mormon, uh, book of Mormon research. And if I could just say one more thing quickly on the, uh, the Jacob text. It's interesting to me that the uh, so-called acceptive clause, right, for the practice of polygamy in the in in my study of reception history, never gets taken uh, that way, except by groups that practice polygamy. Right. Uh, which which is interesting if you try to reverse engineer to sort of figure out how that functions rhetorically. But I'll I'll sign off. Uh, and and thank you for for that engagement. And I may try to get back in line after a while. It's fun to see you, Chris. Thank Thanks. You. Okay, Earl Watt, go ahead, please. I've uh, read the book, the uh, Book of Mormon, both with the Mormon and the um, LDS version side by side. And these that phrase is punctuated differently in our Book of Mormon and in okay. yours. Okay. And the punctuation allows us to say, no, you can't have put them in. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, I, I get it. That's uh, it's very controversial, no question. 
uh, our belief system would also say that there's ongoing revelation. And, uh, and if a, a prophet says he's getting new revelation, says this and that, then that's the new thing. So. Okay. Chris, go ahead, please. Thanks. Uh, Bruce, uh, appreciate the book. Um, there was uh, an early Pentecostal figure who also around the time of Reynolds had bought into British Israelism. And I was, I was in contact recently with Matt Harris, who said that um, this seems to have been a rather extensive view in LDS history. Is that, I mean, I, so Reynolds is not the only one who subscribes to this, or could you place him for me in, in the broader context? Yes, I can. And I know Matt very well. He and I are very close friends, uh, plus uh, uh, some others that I've interacted with over the years on this very uh, subject, and it's a sensitive one. Uh, it's my observation that uh, Reynolds heard about it in his youth, and it came to fruition uh, in big time big time in Britain in the 1870s, probably when uh, he got exposed to it again on his second mission, and then uh, being in touch with the uh, British people in the 1870s, 1880s. And then in the 1880s, he started writing a serial of articles called Are We of Israel, in which he uh, threw little snippets, sometimes big ones, uh, of the uh, doctrines and teachings coming out of uh, Anglo-Israelism. He admits in, in his writings that he doesn't subscribe to all of it. By the way, it has another term, British Israelism is sometimes used, not just Anglo-Israelism. Uh, he said he likes a lot of it. He didn't like all, necessarily all of it, uh, but he felt that some of it was inspired. Uh, the offshoot eventually of British Israelism is that God likes white people and doesn't necessarily like people of other colors because the uh, British... Uh, who were colonialists, were white, and uh, they would spread their ideas, and they would uh, be leaders and rulers over the other people, like the indigenous uh, Americans, the American Indians uh, in this continent, and then, of course, in Africa and in the Pacific, and on and on. Uh, and, this, uh, and British Israelism certainly promoted the concept uh, that white was better, and the other races were uh, less uh, worthy. Now, uh, Reynolds, I don't think, really got so much into that aspect of it, but it is an offshoot of that point of view. Okay, uh, Reynolds dies in 1909, and uh, his son-in-law, Joseph Fielding Smith, by this time, uh, or not even by this time, but uh, a couple of years after the death of George Reynolds, becomes, becomes a young apostle. He's the son of the president of the church, George, Joseph F. Smith, and Joseph Fielding Smith uh, became the head of the Utah Genealogical Society, which was the arm of the church in promoting genealogical research. And they had a magazine. And uh, some of the other people who wrote for that magazine under Joseph Fielding Smith, along with him, wrote many articles that promoted the idea uh, that the British were uh, favored. And what they did in bringing uh, uh, freedom and, and many other good ideas uh, to America was God's will, and that Israel was among them, and they and those who came to America, New Zealand, Canada, and colonial Africa who were white uh, were of Israel, and the leaders of the uh, human race, and uh, and it can now look be looked back upon as a form of racism and just and self justification for people to think that uh, they are better and those uh, particularly of the African uh, ancestry were inferior. It contributed to that concept and keeping that going. So he's he's not an outlier. No, he, yeah, but, but, I think he but I think he's the first one to uh, bring it to the fore in publication in our church. Uh, thanks very much. You bet. Hey, Paul, go ahead. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the comment about uh, replenishing the earth. And I've noted that uh, quite a lot of Mormon families do uh, 
apparently clearly ex uh, want to expand upon that. But I'm curious, uh, what is the Mormon concept of, the, of, of when the earth is plenished? In other words, if it's being replenished, how far do we have to go? How, how much of a population do we have to make to uh, provide? It would appear that we've got close to the carrying capacity or perhaps a bit over the, the population carrying capacity today. And so I'm in, interested in how how that uh, that predicate um, is understood in a day when population abundance is quite clear. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I began my uh, teaching career in the church's educational system in the year 1970. In that very year or in 1971, an article appeared in the, the new magazine at that time called The Enzyme that went on for about 50 years uh, on the subject of overpopulation because it had, it had become vogue in the late 60s and early 1970s, that the earth was, uh, getting, it, it w w was going to have too many people for the resources. And so uh, a sociologist and a scholar in that area uh, wrote an article that was in the uh, Enzyme. I remember it quite well. And he justified the fact that uh, Mormons would have large families and they should not be condemned for it because uh, he felt that uh, God would provide not only for them, uh, but also for all the human race. And sure enough, uh, new innovations came about in agriculture uh, and, uh, and in the whole science of nutrition, making it possible for uh, more agricultural products abundance uh, in subsequent years in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and so forth. Uh, and so that idea kind of subsided for a while, but now it's back again, for sure, like you hint at all. Um, uh, I'm an environmentalist, a very active one, and I'm very upset about, of course, the climate changes that are taking place and the horrible uh, effects of, uh, of that. Uh, and it's too bad. And of course, uh, mankind has contributed to it, uh, this horrible thing. Uh, we have a philosophy, and it was actually enunciated in our general conference by one of the junior apostles just a couple of years ago. His name is Garrett W. Gong. Uh, he's a, a, an Asian American. His father was Chinese uh, and Chinese American. And then uh, uh, Garrett Gong is born to him. And he has Dutch ancestry as well. Well, anyway, uh, Garrett Gong gave a big talk about the fact that uh, uh, there are now 80 billion people on planet Earth. And eight uh, and he made such a, uh, not a, uh, eight million, excuse me, eight, yes, eight, eight billion. billion, eight billion, I'm so sorry, I'm getting, getting this wrong, eight billion. And uh, of course, it could have been 170, 180 billion in history. Um, and he said, and the philosophy is, every one of these human beings now and before and to come are numbered unto God, every one of them. And every one of them has a story, particularly those who've lived any length of time here upon the earth. He promoted the idea of people writing these stories about yourselves, about your family, about your ancestors. Uh, we're really big in our tradition about writing family histories and contributing to them. We have this program called Family Search where we're trying to get all the people that we possibly can, and we already have millions, uh, onto a tree. Uh, uh, that, that we're all part of the same family, same family of God. And Elder Gong made a big deal about every one of these being important uh, in God's economy, and that God will make it possible for every one of them to hear the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to accept it or to reject it. Uh, he, he said that uh, we have a lot of problems, people suffer, but every one of them is important in, in God's sight. Uh, so I guess that is part of the answer. Uh, we also believe that uh, the second coming of the Lord is forthcoming, I don't know when. Uh, many people believe it's uh, near, some people think it's a little bit farther away, but in any event, that is part of the equation. Uh, there's been nothing uh, given from the leadership of our church to uh, 
tell people to uh, restrict the number of people in your family. However, these statistics are definitely telling. Uh, when I was growing up uh, in the era of my parents, the average uh, family in Mormondom would be six children, six, seven, eight. Now it's only two and a half. So uh, times have changed. Uh, uh, and birth control was once condemned in our church and is now fully accepted as something that uh, a couple can choose to do if they bring it before God as to what they would do in their own family. So uh, times have changed in that regard. Thank you. James Lucas, go ahead, please. I know Christopher's up, but he's conceding for a minute. Go ahead, James. Second. Okay. Uh, I have, um, uh, the, these are all very interesting and profound questions. I have a very mundane question, uh, which is um, George Reynolds, he basically uh, was serving on missions uh, and then he was engaged in this voluminous and very uh, productive uh, career as a writer, uh, producer of books and articles and so forth. Um, and he had uh, three wives and 32 children. Is that what you said? Yes. So my, my mundane question is, how on earth did he support himself? Was he... <laughs> Did, did he get uh, make a lot of money off of these books? The, was his salary as a private secretary to the church president sufficient to to support all these people? Did the wives uh, produce income? How, just how did he financially do all this? Good grief. Yeah. And he was in prison for a while. <laughs> uh, the prison thing uh, did not work against him financially. <clears throat> he did receive a salary uh, from the church. It was modest. Uh, but uh, when he lost all opportunities to get a pardon and, and to be relieved of his prison sentence, uh, John Taylor, who had uh, succeeded Brigham Young as the leader of the church, placed his hands on George Reynolds and actually gave him a blessing and set him apart. We have a phrase in our church called setting a person apart to a calling such as a bishop. Uh, I've been a bishop twice, and in both cases, I was set apart properly by the laying on fans. And all the apostles and all the leaders and, and all the callings we get actually were supposed to be set apart. Well, he was set apart to be uh, to, to take on this responsibility of uh, representing the church. And he was charged in this blessing to uh, uh, learn more about the scriptures so that he could teach them effectively for the rest of his life. And of course, he dedicated himself to it. Uh, John Taylor made it possible for him to receive when he came back uh, from prison, the exact amount of money he would have earned if he had served as a secretary. He got the exact amount he would have earned. It was modest, but at least it uh, helped take care of him. <clears throat> it is true that his wives uh, uh, worked at home in sewing and, uh, and would do some domestic work for other people. And I guess that helped. The economy was far different in those days. We have to fully comprehend it. We cannot use presentism. We cannot use uh, 2024 economic circumstances to throw back on them then. It would have been virtually impossible for a, a person with modest uh, means to uh, take care of three families. But uh, they could grow gardens. They could uh, take care of their family with food. Uh, and uh, during his prison time, uh, there were friends and family who, who helped uh, with contributions for food and, and other needs. Uh, George ended up uh, building two houses uh, for his two families, his first two wives. And then uh, his second wife became quite ill and he married his third wife when his first wife was ill. And, and, and so uh, it wasn't long when she passed away. And so he had two again. And, and so these two homes, which were side by side, and they still exist in, in the Avenue section of Salt Lake City. I don't know if that answers everything, but uh, it was a time of modest means. He never got rich, but uh, the family lived okay, I guess. Okay, thank you. Hey, Chris, it's your turn again. Hey, thanks. Thanks for indulging me. Um, Bruce 
I appreciated your exclamation uh, explanation mm -hmm. on the uh, the commentary, the jointly authored commentary. Uh, a few year, um, two or three years ago, I was asked to write an article on uh, Book of Mormon theology. And of course, I located the section in the commentary, but I then traced it back to, is it pronounced uh, Shodol? Uh, I've, heard, I've heard different pronunciations. I'm sure in the old country it wasn't that, but they pronounced it in America, Shodol. And he had written that pretty early on. And so that that's a that's a helpful explanation to me. Thank you for that. I, uh, I think it's a travesty, actually. I, I am very offended by what... Uh, his son-in-law did. It was uh, it was uh, Brother Shodal's son-in-law who pulled off that feat and made it look like it was a co-authorship. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, and I, I, I would like, if you don't mind, to go back to the topic of the night, polygamy. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> as I was reading your um, your Reynolds biography, and it's been a, a while back, <clears throat> so I may be a bit off about this. It seemed to me, if I recall correctly, that there were lots of uh, struggles for Reynolds uh, in his polygamous uh, life. Um, and it seemed to me that that mirrored in some ways, or, or uh, B.H. Roberts's experience would mirror in some ways perhaps Reynolds' experience. Am I misremembering or is that an accurate sort of um, um, understanding of his, his polygamous life? <clears throat> sort of. Uh, in all of my writings. That's, uh, a, that's about right for me, sort of. <laughs> in all of my writings on Reynolds, on uh, Phelps, and I'm now writing a biography on Isaac C. Haight, I, I always believe in providing the context so that... Uh, we can understand the time period and the circumstances which help bring about what happened in that particular person's and his family's life. <laughs> and I did so about polygamy for George Reynolds. Uh, I, I looked into other contemporary writings of the time when I was writing this in the 1980s. There have been a lot more since, but <clears throat> I discovered that uh, those who had written by that time had come up with uh, a percentage that about 50% of the uh, plural marriages in uh, Mormondom uh, between 1850 and 1890 had both good and not so good experiences, happy and unhappy, kind of a mixed. Uh, that would be the case for Reynolds, and I'll mention more about that in a moment. 25% uh, of those engaged in it with two or more wives, 25% had nothing but very positive and uplifting experiences in their family lives but only a quarter. And then 25% had very unfortunate and very unhappy experiences. So uh, it, it it went the whole the full spectrum. <clears throat> In uh, Reynolds' case now, uh, his first wife obeyed what is found in uh, the, li uh, the literature directing how plural marriages should be performed called the law of Sarah uh, because Sarah consented to Abraham, it says, in the Bible, to allow him to take on an additional spouse. And according to that law, then, in these times, uh, the first wife should be engaged in identifying who that new wife could be, and at least giving her permission, and actually attending the, uh, the endowment house or the temple, and being there, and actually putting her hand on the hands of the uh, husband and the new wife uh, and the, in the sealing ceremony. Uh, well, that happened with the first wife and the second. And, and uh, I don't know enough about the third one. To, well, no, it was done secretly, so it wasn't happening then. <clears throat> but they did. But the but the third wife was really a wonderful, fantastic woman, and she did everything in her uh, power to make peace uh, with the family. The second wife, named Amelia, was a little more cranky. She uh, she kept saying that. Uh, her husband, George, paid more attention to the first wife and the first wife's children. Well, George was bothered by that because he kept a record of when he stayed at one house and when he stayed at the second house. And it was actually a little bit more with Amelia than it was with Polly. He actually had a record to prove that 
he was giving a bit more attention to Amelia than he was with Polly. Uh, and, uh, and he certainly loved all very much. And uh, when he was with Polly's family, uh, he would uh, take a, focus on one child at a time and take that child out for a walk and would spend time with that child for the rest of the evening. And then one after another, as he alternated between the different wives and, and in his record, uh, and his children bear this out in their telling of the stories, that he would give equal attention and he was a kind and generous father to them all. But uh, uh, Amelia was a bit cranky uh, and especially so during his incarceration. So he went out of his way to uh, try to uh, ameliorate that afterwards. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, in the religion department at BYU, uh, when I came out with my book, uh, was a descendant of Joseph Fielding Smith, the uh, son-in-law of George Reynolds. And uh, he told me, what are you doing? When you said the story that she was kind of upset, you kind of mislabeled or, or you kind of defamed my great grandma. Well, I said, I'm just telling the story as I have. It. That's how I believe biography should be written. I tell the story as it basically comes out. I didn't put her down. I just said how she felt. Uh, and, uh, that's my belief system. So I, uh, going back to this idea, uh, his plural marriage situation was one of basic harmony, particularly when the third wife came in and helped out so much, but not without some frustration. Can, can you explain the third marriage you say was secret? Was it secret from the second wife? Was it secret from the public? What? How, how are you using that? From the public, for sure. Uh, remember, uh, it was his case that uh, started the incarcerations, uh, and, and there was no one else who was actually sought out immediately. That kind of calmed things down for two more years. But then the Edmonds Act was passed, and then the uh, Edmonds Tucker Act was passed. And by the time the Edmonds Tucker Act was passed, uh, it eventually took away the right to vote for all polygamous men uh, and polygamous families uh, as uh, time went on. And of course, they were all sought out by federal marshals. And, and the president of the church went into hiding for the last two and a half years of his life. George Buchanan went into hiding. Joseph F. Smith, who was the second counselor, went to Hawaii to stay out of the way. And uh, some of the other guys went on missions to stay out of the way. Uh, it was a very difficult time for Mormons. Uh, I have a great grandfather who hid out. Uh, he was not found, uh, so he didn't have to go to jail. It was a, it, it was a difficult time in the history. You have to have some kind of sympathy for the uh, hounding that took place in those days. Well, the, this was in that height of it. Uh, not quite the ultimate height, but it was getting worse by 1886. And so one, uh, the biggest reason it was kept secret is to keep secret from the world, because, it would, uh, because he would be subject to a second arrest uh, if they found it out. Later, there was a, a Supreme Court case uh, Lorenzo Snow v. United States, which ruled one time in favor of the Mormons. It was a five to four decision that said that you could not prosecute or jail a person a second time for polygamy. Uh, so if, uh, so eventually he would have been free. But in 1886, if it had come to public knowledge that he had married somebody else, he could have been prosecuted and jailed a second time. So that's the biggest reason. Uh, it, it was not kept secret from the family for very long because uh, Mary came into the family and then helped out with the family. So they knew about it, right? Hey, Paul, go ahead, please. I am very interested in this uh, test and the implications it has for our understanding of the relationship between the church and the state. And so what would you extract from this experience? What, uh, what should that relationship be? What kind of relationship could we expect in Zion between the church and the state? Uh, when I wrote the biography, it was uh, the Reynolds v. United States by uh, Supreme Court scholars was listed among the 100 most influential decisions. I would suppose that it may go down in the list after a while. Uh, but it uh, it was quoted and cited in many other decisions into the 20th century, uh, dealing with other religious denominations, including Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, 
where they were denied some privileges based on the fact that the Mormons were denied this particular privilege. Uh, however, uh, by the 1980s, and then certainly into the 1990s and early 2000s, times had so changed in, in looking at sexual behavior. We have the Loving decision, which uh, states that uh, if it's private, behind closed doors, any type of behavior by consenting adults, sexual or otherwise, is okay, uh, uh, with the, uh, as long as it's not breaking any other laws. In other words, you can commit adultery, you can do anything you want behind closed doors, and if you're not offending other people uh, and breaking other laws. Uh, well, what about polygamy then? Well, uh, that certain cases came before various lower courts. There was a police officer in the state of Utah for one of the cities who was a polygamist. We, we have polygamous offshoots right now in Utah, as undoubtedly you've all heard, uh, offshoots from our church. They are not members of our church, uh, but polygamists nevertheless. And uh, one of them was a police officer. Well, uh, he was fired, and, and so it, uh, it went before the uh, appellate court in Denver, and uh, and he was uh, and, and it was ruled at the time that the uh, city had a right to do what it did. However, since that time, uh, a lot more tolerance of uh, all kinds of marital behaviors has entered the American scene and freedom that way. And uh, and even to the point now that uh, no one hounds polygamists whatsoever in the state of Utah. When Utah became a state, it had to outlaw polygamy. And for a long time, polygamists were uh, in, rest, uh, in Utah. But uh, that's all over. Uh, and uh, this whole idea of uh, marriage, uh, where well, we know the uh, Obergefell uh, decision about seven years ago allows for a same-sex marriage in America. So uh, there's a lot more tolerance of different uh, marriage systems in America than there used to be. And would you project a relationship between church and the state for the Zionic community? Well, of course, we have our points of view in our church. Uh, uh, plural marriage was suspended uh, in 1890. That's a good word for in our point of view. Uh, we believe that it was uh, done sacredly by some of the ancients, uh, not by all of them, uh, and uh, that when it was practiced under proper priesthood authority and lived in righteousness, if it was, uh, then it's sanctioned by God, too. And uh, there's a form of eternal polygamy even today because a man uh, who loses his first wife with whom he is sealed for all eternity, but he loses her to death and he's single now, a widower, of course, legally, he has the privilege of marrying somebody else. Of course he can. But in the church, he can also be sealed to this woman if she's a single woman. That, ha that has happened quite frequently for many people including the current president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Russell Nelson. He lost his first wife 20 years ago. He's married a second one. Both are sealed to him, so that's an internal form of polygamy. Uh, and uh, in terms of Zion and the idea of having a pure and holy people, uh, it is our point of view that if uh, lived in righteousness, uh, God will work out the relationships where they can live in harmony like many polygamous relationships did live in harmony. So I guess that's the answer to the idea of a Zionic community. Thank you. Hey, James, go ahead, please. Uh, okay, just to make two quick points. Uh, <clears throat> just to uh, be the lawyer on the uh, call here, um, the history of uh, the First Amendment uh, freedom of religion uh, in the uh, United States legal system is actually quite complicated. Um, I mean, Reynolds v. U.S. is an extremely significant case historically. However, it's been undermined considerably in modern times, as Bruce uh, indicated. Um, there was a famous case in the 1960s by the Warren Court called Yoder v. Wisconsin, uh, yeah. which allowed Amish people to 
not have to send their children to school after the eighth grade. And um, at least, uh, you know, one person, uh, you know, the famous Justice William Douglas, who actually dissent was the only dissenter from that decision, said that, you know, you folks have basically overruled U.S. v. Reynolds with this case. Um, and there was actually quite some commentary uh, mm -hmm. about that um, in the LDS legal community at the time as to whether that meant that, uh, you know, uh, polygamy was no longer uh, could be made illegal. But it's now a very complicated thing. Uh, as Bruce indicated, the Obergefell decision of, um, you know, clouds, uh, the situation, uh, the court has kind of become more conservative since the 1960s, since the Warren Court. So actually, it's uh, kind of an interesting scholarly issue in the legal community still exactly where this all stands. Um, but, you know, uh, Mormon polygamy uh, remains uh, a very important from a historical legal point of view uh, in First Amendment uh, jurisprudence. And I'm, there's probably a lot more to be said. I haven't followed this as much recently as I uh, once did. Uh, but I would like to uh, point, uh, go instead to your Zion comment. Uh, uh, and I think the issue, Paul, uh, as to what would uh, the attitude be in a Zionic community towards polygamy uh, depends in part on who is in the Zionic community. In other words, uh, you know, when we talk about a Zionic community, are we talking about only uh, people in the restoration? Um, you know, to maybe be broadly, are we talking about only people who adhere to a certain branch of the restoration? Or are we thinking of Zion in broader terms as something that encompasses other religions, uh, not only other Christian religions, but uh, do we see it as encompassing other world religions? And if we're going to have a concept of the Zion community as uh, em embracing other world religions and other cultures and other peoples, uh, which is the kind of expansive idea of Zion that I kind of find appealing, uh, then, you know, I think that we would have to accommodate uh, 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 marriage practices in other religions, particularly amongst uh, Muslims, uh, but also there's many cultures where even though they're not Islamic by religion, nonetheless, plural marriage is very much a cultural practice. And, you know, I, I, I'm i not going to, you know, strongly argue that that would have to be the case, but I would say that if, in fact, we're going to be very broad in our concept of Zion, uh, we uh, probably have to be uh, broad in our concept of uh, what kinds of marriage practices uh, from various other religions and other cultures uh, uh, we would accept in a, you know, a Zionic community. So that's sort of my thoughts on that one. I'm intrigued by that uh, response, James, and I appreciate your, your commentary. Um, and I agree that uh, to be an embracive Zion is, is, I think, naturally called for. But as I'm asking the question, it occurs to me that what we're saying is that that uh, governments have to grow a much broader understanding, and perhaps religions do too. That could well be. <laughs> that uh, yes, absolutely. Well, especially if you look at Zion, if you think of Zion in millennial terms, so if you. Uh, if you're, you know, really getting expansive and you're thinking of what will the community be in the millennium where you have millions of people resurrected who were righteous people, but who lived in historical communities, which uh, had, uh, you know, multiple uh, complex, many different kinds of marriage uh, arrangements and so forth, uh, then you'd have to be even, you know, the, the millennial kingdom would have to be even more uh, tolerant if you take that kind of, uh, you know, perspective. Hey, well, let's get Chris back into it. Yep. Hey, thanks for, so much for, for your um, long suffering with me and my questions tonight. Uh, but I have 
I've got this Reynolds expert and I've, I've had several things. Um, Bruce, uh, this volume here, the story of the Book of Mormon that you had mentioned earlier, um, could you <clears throat> kind of place it for us in terms of the sweep of Book of Mormon studies, um, in terms of where it brought the discipline, if you will, and kind of the quality of the work. When I was looking at Chodol's piece on basically theology, I was quite struck by how good the piece was, uh, especially for its time. And so could, could you could you help us a little bit with, with, with this volume? I don't claim to be a great expert on, uh, in answering your question, <clears throat> but I can say this, that uh, uh, the Book of Mormon caught the imagination of uh, a lot of new converts in the 1830s, 1840s, and, and in Britain uh, with a great gathering of uh, converts uh, in the British Isles and into Scandinavia. Uh, but it didn't seem like there were any major Book of Mormon experts who really knew the uh, history uh, and the theology and tying it all together. Uh, George Q. Cannon obviously knew quite a bit, and he enlisted his uh, junior partner, uh, George Reynolds, to write lots of articles to explain uh, biblical history stories, but then Book of Mormon stories, particularly as they came out of the uh, prison writings of uh, 1880 and 18, 1879 and 1880. <clears throat> and the story of the Book of Mormon is the first full volume that deals with the entire book, both theologically and historically speaking. And it was used in Sunday school, so the youth of the church used it all the time. And so that got people to really understand the full story of the book. Uh, then in the 20th century, we, we had other people who did kind of the same thing. But uh, I think the uh, first major uh, theologian uh, uh, of Book of Mormon themes that was, like you say, uh, Jean Chaudal, and then uh, those two authors kind of were co-mingled in that uh, seven-volume set, but not knowing exactly who was who uh, in those writings because it, it isn't identified. Uh, like uh, I have pointed out, though, starting in the late 1980s and ever since that time, all sorts of people have thrown their hands into writing commentaries on specific portions of the Book of Mormon and uh, and a full com a full commentary set, you know, volumes, multi volumes. Uh, I, I suppose that uh, Reynolds uh, got the ball rolling and uh, got people interested in the whole book, including geography. And geography is uh, one of the big questions that always comes up. It has in this group, I know. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I, I guess you can say he got things started. I, I don't know how much any of the current writers of the Book of Mormon, however, look back upon what Reynolds did. You have, I can see, and I know, but I'm not sure that uh, a lot of people have. Do, do you recall if he engaged the work of M.T. Lamb, of the Gold Bible or the Golden Bible, in some of his uh, apologetic work, Bruce? I, I cannot remember that he had. He did deal with the Spalding issue, however, at great length. Uh, it, uh, th there's a booklet of his serial of articles. He wrote about eight articles about the Spalding manuscript and how incorrect it is as the origin of the Book of Mormon. Uh, and so he dealt with that one apologetically, but I, I can't remember anything about what happened. Thanks so much, Bruce, and, and okay. thanks to the group. Let David go first. Okay, go ahead, please, David. Thank you, and thank you, Bruce. It's been very, very informative, and I really appreciate it. And it triggers questions uh, for me, one that's uh, quite different from what we've been dealing with here. But uh, the, uh, the Israelites were mentioned. It's my understanding in the early Restoration Movement, being part of the House of Israel was extremely important and taught. Uh, evangelist blessings, for example, would show that people belong to a particular tribe. Uh, later, that became adopted into a particular tribe. Uh, 
in the community of Christ, at this point, I think the emphasis is so much more on the worth of all persons that the whole idea of being part of the house of Israel has uh, well, it's disappeared. We're just not even mentioned anymore. It's the worth of all person that's important. I'm curious about where the rest of the restoration movements are as far as belief in being part of the house of Israel. My hunch is that uh, it is no longer a major subject in most of those branches. Uh, I'm not an expert, but I haven't heard them talk about it. I will say this, though, in my branch, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the term Israel has taken on a major, and I emphasize the word major, rejuvenation uh, under Russell M. Nelson. <clears throat> he says, and he says it emphatically, the gathering of the house of Israel is the most important activity that any one of us and we as a group of people are to be engaged in right now. And he says the word Israel means uh, uh, God prevail, God shall prevail. He uses the original meaning. And he wants God to prevail, and it's Israel. Uh, the definition of Israel in the church of Jesus, uh, the, the Israelite, uh, uh, the house of Israel, in, in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is either direct descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the 12 sons of Jacob, or... And you've mentioned the idea of uh, adoption, uh, people who may not be direct descendants being adopted into the house of Israel, which was promised anciently through Abraham, the blessings of Abraham, the covenant of Abraham, renewed through Isaac, renewed through Jacob, uh, and emphasized again and again in the Old Testament and in the Book of Mormon. You have to admit that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come up again and again and again in the Book of Mormon, as well as the whole house of Israel. Jesus himself taught a lot about the various tribes of Israel. He talked about the fact that, that, that uh, he himself, Jesus, once he left the uh, Nephites and Lamanites in the New World, would go and, and deal with the other groups of the house of Israel. And, that, uh, and ultimately, we read in the second book of Nephi uh, that uh, records are being kept by those other tribes. Somewhere. And in due time, <clears throat> the records of uh, the Jews and the Israelites of the Old Testament period are joined with the records of the Book of Mormon and will later be joined with uh, those other records uh, that will eventually come to pass. Uh, anyway, uh, it's big time in um, my church, uh, this whole idea of the gathering of Israel, and that's in all countries. Uh, one of the things that I do, uh, even in my retirement, but professionally speaking, but for no money, uh, is uh, teach in BYU Pathway, Brigham Young University Pathway Worldwide is an organization that allows for people to start and complete bachelor's degrees <clears throat> as they do it at home uh, in their various countries. And we're now in BYU Pathway in about 160 countries. And I teach uh, the religion classes that are part of the BYU Pathway curriculum uh, to uh, Zoom groups in Europe and in Africa, South, uh, South Africa, and in other countries in the southern part of Africa. And uh, Africa, uh, in other words, we believe that the, uh, the many converts of our church in Africa, and by the way, the continent of Africa has the strongest uh, um, proselytizing success of any place in the whole world, Africa, right now. <clears throat> and because of that, uh, they, are is they are either Israelites by partial ancestral, connections or they're adopted in. By the way, uh, my patriarchal blessing, we call the evangelistic blessings in our church patriarchal blessings. Mine says that I am a descendant of Joseph and Ephraim of the Old Testament. Uh, I don't believe that all of my ancestry comes from Joseph and Ephraim. I don't believe that. I don't think that many of us do believe that, but partially, yes. And therefore, uh, we believe that we are part of the house of Israel that way. But it doesn't make any difference whether you are descendant or not, because uh, once you are baptized and accept the principles of the gospel and the ordinances thereof, uh, you are recipient of the same blessings, and, it may, and it's called adoption. Thank you. Very informative. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay. Well, I'm 
Yeah. Hi, Bruce. I appreciate your presentation. Um, you were touching on something here a moment ago, and I'd like you to expound on it. Um, you're talking about being a direct descendant of someone way back, you know, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, when I do my math on this, you know, you got two parents, you got four great, you know, grandparents, you got eight great grandparents, you go back 10 generations, you're going to have a thousand people on that one line. You go back another 10 generations, you're going to have a million on that line. And, and here you've only gone back, what, 500 years. You go back another 10 generations, and now you're going back around 750 years. And you go back another 10 generations, you're going back another, what, 40 generations, if I do my math right. Um, you're only halfway to Christ, and here on that one line, you're already, what, about a trillion people on that one line? And I do my math on that and figure, what's the chances that we're going to be descended from about everybody, everybody's neighbor going back, you know, at the time of Christ? And we're, we still haven't gone back to the 12 tribes yet. Um, so to me, it seems like we're all descended from about everybody back, you know, way back when. And, and uh, you know, so how, how can we identify we're descended from a certain person, what, what have you? Good questions. <clears throat> uh, among other things, I'm a genealogist. <clears throat> I've even uh, been the director of uh, my uh, local community's Family History Center, and there are family history centers all over the globe now that are sponsored by our church. <clears throat> so I'm very interested in the subject. And I do promote the idea of getting to know uh, our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents. I really make a big deal about this in my personal ministry, getting to know each of our eight great grandparents. I've even got posters where I have the pictures, photographs of each of my eight, and I tell stories about each of them so I get to know them. And, uh, and of course, I want to know even beyond that. Uh, your math, of course, is very significant. But what I have learned from genealogy is that uh, if you go back a few generations, they end up being some of the same people in this line. And this line, they're actually some of the same, they're the same people. <laughs> and, uh, and it kind of gets mixed in. I will agree completely that we're all very closely related if we go back very far. Uh, the, that's one of the reasons why I emphasize that I am not nor would anybody probably in our faith tradition uh, could, could be expected to be a pure descendant of the, the 12 tribes of Israel. There's nobody else in our ancestry. We obviously have a big mixture. Uh, and uh, DNA tends to prove that. And, uh, and in my DNA analysis, uh, there's some Neanderthal and so on. Uh, so, uh, and, we, and we do believe that we all are related sooner or later, pretty soon. One of the things that happens in our church's family search program is that uh, you can get an app uh, on your smartphone and uh, and if there are other people in the same room that you are and they have the same app, you can find out if you're related to anybody in the same room, if they all turn on. And it turns mm -hmm. out, oh, I'm related to you as a eighth cousin, five times removed or whatever, it tells you that. Well, it, it proves that we are all related one form or another. Uh, so I, your point is well taken. I don't know if I've completely answered your question, but uh, I, I understand the mathematics are tough. But what I have understood is that you go back a few generations and this person here is your ancestor on this line, but he is also your ancestor on this line. Same guy. Thank you. Thank you. David, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I don't think I have much to add to that. I was going to mentioned that the mathematics is accurate and very, very misleading because, uh, as was just mentioned, the same people show up over and over again, and that isn't included in the mathematics. So the mathematics is misleading, but I certainly, strongly, absolutely buy the fact that genetically we're all related. Good. Okay. Monty, go ahead. I think we're getting some static from somebody. Go ahead, Monty. Okay, I was, uh, I, I, I tried to stab at figuring out ancestry, and it, I got so confused that, you know, I came, I came about with 
two, uh, two, two basic ideas as a result of this. Number one, it's only possible for some of these things to be true if they were originally related to Kevin Bacon. And number number and the other, the second thing is uh, uh, I'm really lost interest in the study of genie. And uh, it, so gene, genealogy was just not in the part for me. <laughs> wow. Also figured out that a lot of my ancestors aren't worth knowing. <laughs> I think we should tell the truth of our ancestors. Um, you, you can always bring up the uh, good sides if you uh, can find them, but uh, you should tell the story warts and all. I believe. Okay, thanks. Uh, oh. Auntie, you need to remute. Oh. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. I, I wanted to uh, to raise an interesting, to me, an interesting parallel because where you're talking about George Reynolds as the secretary in the reorganization, the, the secretary was Henry Stebbins. And Henry Stebbins also had a very deep interest in the Book of Mormon and wrote quite a substantial amount about it. And I'm in the process of trying to work my way through the books that we have at the Joseph Smith Historic Site. Uh, many many uh, that are coded, that is, that they were wrote under a pseudonym, and fascinating, though, to, to see the parallels between those two gentlemen. And so I particularly appreciate the research that you've done, because I can see there's a lot of it ahead of me on Henry Stebbins, who, by the way, was emphatic that... Uh, that the Book of Mormon was in Central America, not South America. <laughs> and so he and uh, Reynolds were in, in clear disagreement on that, on the geology. Uh, when did Stebbins live? What were his years? He was Joseph Smith III's secretary, knew him from Nauvoo, lived uh, in Lamoni, um, and he published up until about 19, oh, I think 11 or 12. He died early and his wife lived to be 100 years old. She died in 1958. And I knew her, I had the chance to make noise on her uh, pump organ, which is very similar to the one that we have on display at the Joseph Smith house now. As a matter of fact, we have this, some of the Steb Stebbins furniture there, including the desk that Henry and Joseph III shared. Um, that, that is fascinating. It looks like they were quite contemporaneous. Uh, yeah, they would. They would. Yeah, you were talking about two secretaries that were significant secretaries for their churches at the same time, and, and the secretaries played a huge role. I, I've written an article about uh, secretaries. Uh, most of the uh, leaders of the church, the presidents had more than one secretary, usually a private secretary, and then three or four others. And I've written a paper called "Close to the Seat of Power." They get involved in what, uh, and they're there for all the decision talk. Uh, mm -hmm. But they uh, don't have a a vote, maybe. But uh, they're there, and they know what's going on, and they end up answering a lot of questions. In the case of George Reynolds, he uh, uh, he was actually given the assignment by uh, uh, Joseph F. Smith. When questions came to headquarters, Reynolds would be given the uh, questions, and he would send back the answers. Henry Stebbins was the secretary to the Order of Enoch which was the organization that uh, walked around through the Midwest to find a place to settle, to gather. And they they were the ones that purchased the 3,000 acres that then became Lamoni. And uh, they got the, the town established for the train to come through in 1879. I know so, some yeah. of that story. That's really exciting. And a lot, a lot, lots of fun. I, I wish you'd had a chance to come for the tour. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot more. We, we have a lot more to, to share on our secretaries here. We will. I hope we can do that. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're approaching 10 o'clock. We're really getting close to it. And uh, we try to commonly let some of us who haven't eaten supper yet or uh, need to go. I let the dog out. Oh, yeah. Other important things like eating the dog out. Um, 
And so let me thank you all for your kind attention. Uh, let me also point out that we have, um, starting next week, Blair Bryant will be leading his characters discussion, his characters class at seven o'clock on the same uh, the same link. And so Robert uh, will be opening the link at 6.30 instead of 7.30 to uh, let people get in on the Book of Mormon characters class that, uh, that Blair Bryant has proposed. And if you're interested in that class, then contact uh, Robert Cook to get the five page a preliminary guideline and be prepared to to examine it. It's going to be a fascinating study because he has spent 30 years examining those doc the, those characters and the research he's done clearly deserves the the attention of some good students. And I'd like to consider you all among that group. And if there are no other questions, good night. The Lord is watching over you. Good night, his blessings go before you. Good night, and we'll be praying for you. So good night, may God bless you. And uh, thank you, Brother Neanderthal, because we also share those genes. <laughs>